The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. It's like you're boxing. All right, so we have a, a special day today. We have, um, you know, one of the Big Island's favorite sons, a staple of the Momentum generation, former CT competitor, the profile subject of the 2002 film The Blueprint, uh, someone who, who then went on to really redefine the boundaries of big wave surfing, both toe and paddle, uh, celebrated hunter, a waterman, and a family man. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on here, but we have the singular Shane Dorian on the lineup today. Shane, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that's quite an intro. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was writing this out and I'm like, we're going to need like probably seven hours. This could be like a seven parter or something to kind of get through everything. But you're, you're coming to us from the North shore today. Is that right? I am. Yeah. I've been, I've been living on the North shore for like the last two and a half months. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm here with my son, Jackson. We got a little place on the beach, uh, by Pupukea close to pipeline and just been doing a ton of surfing and, um, a lot of living, a lot of, a lot of training, a lot of, um, you know, everything around here revolves around the surf. So it's been an amazing winter for surf as well. So it's been easy to stay busy. Right on. I was going to ask about that because, because is your home base still on the big island? Obviously you travel a lot, but, but if that's the case, you know, you, you mentioned spending two and a half months on the North shore already. Is that pretty average for you season after season? Is it, you know, three to four months on the North shore? Do you kind of set up a remote base? You know, it's kind of changed over the years. Um, you know, I, I, I moved here when I was 15 years old by myself and lived on my friend uh, Jason Magalenis's, uh floor. His dad, Sino, was my surfboard shaper back in the day. And so when I was like, yeah, when I was 15 years old, I basically like lived on their floor and um, went to school kind of near Haleiwa in uh, Wailua town. And yeah, so I spent like six months a year uh, living here from my freshman year all the way through my senior year. And then after that, the next few years after that, I still stayed here for like five or six months um, each winter. And then when I had kids, um, I wanted to stay home as much as I possibly could. So I was only on the North shore, really the, the weeks that I sort of had to be. Right. And then it's funny too, because I kind of thought it was so hectic at that point. And I just wanted to stay home and be mellow and kind of get away from the crowds and the traffic and like the hecticness of the, of the hecticness is not a word, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, of the North shore. Cause it can be pretty intense. And then now it's pretty funny cause I have a 16 year old Grom who loves to surf and he's so focused on surfing that it, there's a lot of synergy for us to be here. It's really natural for us to be here and kind of hang out and surf and live. And it gets me surfing a whole lot more as well. So I'm stoked. That's cool. And, and, you know, like we're going to get into this a little bit, I'm sure, but the, the, kind of the framework of the tours changed so much in recent years too. And, you know, it used to be, we'd have the, the triple crown, you'd have the end of the year QS events at Haleva and sunset beach. And then the final CT of the year at pipeline. And it was also, it felt like the industry kind of at the high watermark was sending teams of marketing people and models and, you know, young surfers and free surfers and filmers and, and going back to that, that kind of hectic vibe. It was so intense for those, you know, six weeks to eight weeks, but now that it's changed, have you, have, does it feel different to you having kind of been through all of that where now it's like, there's probably pockets of, of energy and intensity, but it's not condensed across those kind of six weeks anymore. Yeah, you're right. It's not, it isn't such an, like an apex climax type of mm. deal. Um, you know, for years we had this like kind of like late November through like the mid part of December where it was like this crescendo of crowds and traffic and intense mayhem. Um, and now it's kind of like a little mellower, but dispersed for a lot longer amount of right. time. So like we got here at the very start of November or even like late October, and then it started kind of ramping up a little bit, but not a whole lot. And then it's been kind of steady all the way through. So we've had, you know, like the, like the van, the vans pipe event. Um, and then we had like backdoor shootout and there's some other events in there and 
So we've had a bunch of like traveling surfers coming in and out. And then we had the QS at uh, Holly Eva and, and just there's been an event. So there's been kind of quite a few pro surfers around, but not every single person on earth has been here yet. So right. it, it, it's been a little busy, like at say pipeline and stuff like that. But there's been a lot of surf, been a lot of really consistent swells lately. Kind of every single spot's been going off. So there's 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 been some great opportunities to surf. Oh, that's cool. And, and you mentioned you guys have your little zone at, at Pupakea and, and obviously for, for decades, a lot of the major brands have had places kind of on that off the wall backdoor pipe stretch, you know, Billabong's had a place there. Do you guys kind of spend any time over there or, or do you kind of keep to yourselves? Yeah, we, you know, um, we're, we're definitely, um, you know, it's funny on the North shore, like it's like, I feel like every other house is filled with pro servers that you know right and so like you know within like five houses from where we're staying there's like probably 15 20 pro servers staying here so you you, you sort of can't miss people and it's easy to hang out there's always like a time there's all there's always like a reason to go like after you surf go up to your friend's house and like hang out with all the boys who live in front of Bubu care rocky point rocky rights sunset beach pipeline off the wall there's houses in front of each one of those that are, that are kind of housing pro servers that you know um, but yeah, the, the houses at, uh, that pipeline and off the wall and back door, those ones are definitely like right on the 50 yard line. Um, I haven't been doing that much hanging out this year, to be totally honest. I've been a little bit on my own program surfing when I can doing a lot of, um, kind of like doing a lot of training and doing some other stuff. And then my, my son has, has been surfing his brains out as well, doing, spending a lot of time, um, at, 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 at back door and pipeline. That's really cool. And, you know, the, the timing of this conversation worked out pretty well. Last week, you announced that you've been with Billabong for 32 years. You've just re-signed uh, another extension, which probably puts you in like the upper, upper percentile of like longest sponsored surfers in history. I mean, maybe Aki and Billabong, Tom Carroll and Quicksilver come to mind, but you've been sponsored by Billabong longer than a lot of their team writers have even been alive. That is very true. Um, yeah, 32 years. Um, I signed with Billabong when I was 18 and now I'm 50. So it's been a wild run, wild ride, um, lots of ups and downs and countless amount of really fun trips with different generations of surfers throughout the years. Everyone, like you said, from Aki all the way down now to like the youngest juniors, you know, doing um, Billabong Bloodlines development camps with them. I'm really involved with the guys coming up from all around the world. Every year yeah. we have, we have camps here on the North shore that, uh, we invite surfers like the, the best amateur surfers from right. Australia and Europe and Japan and Brazil. Um, it's really fun to, you know, to work with some of the youngest guys and, and go on, go on trips with them as well. That's really cool. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because I mean, it's no secret there's been so much change in the industry, especially in the last couple of decades or last 10 years. But, you know, it does feel like the programs that have endured and have kind of you know, crystallized and in some cases enhanced that sense of identity have been the ones that have had those consistent programs where they've, they've invested in the youth, they've, they've put them on the road, they've put them next to people like yourself. Um, and, and that crew kind of matriculates through the system and they become, you know, world-class free surfers or QS campaigners or CT surfers or world title contenders. And obviously that's something that probably formed, you know, throughout your career probably didn't exist when you started, even though that mentor mentee kind of thing probably did, but but it's kind of formalized at a place like Billabong and, it, and the results are pretty staggering when you compare them to other programs out there. Yeah, I think, I think it's been amazing from, from, from like a development standpoint. I mean, like a guy like Griffin Colapinto who rode for Billabong for quite a long time since he was a little junior, hmm. you know, I mean, he, he, he really credits having access to come to Hawaii as much as possible when he was right. young and spending a ton of time at the Billabong house and, and, you know, being mentored by s some of the older guys, who, who really knew the ropes and knew how to surf pipeline, knew how to surf backdoor, knew how mm. to surf sunset, Holly Eva, and had a ton of time surfing with the very best juniors in the world. I mean, that, that development program is second to none. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't really answer your question before, but yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing to be 50 years old and sign a contract with Billabong. I'm incredibly grateful. And I feel like I'm in, a, in some rare air as far as um, being very supported by a great brand who I've been 
um, involved with for a very long time and couldn't be happier, work with really great people there. And it's neat because my position has kind of morphed from like a surfer representing the brand to like now being able to be involved in some, in some development as far as like the juniors go and some of the younger guys coming up as well as some of the product. So, yeah. so it's been really fun and I'm just stoked to be part of the program for sure. That's awesome. So we are recording this on Tuesday, the 17th. Our episode is going to air on Tuesday, the 24th. The Billabong Pro pipeline starts its waiting period on Sunday, the 29th. So we're at, as of recording, we're still a little ways out, but have you been looking at the charts and the forecasts? And, and if so, what, what are you kind of seeing around the, the start of the Billabong Pro pipeline window for, for the venue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was just looking at this yesterday. I'm just checking out the Surfline app forecast pipeline. Starts on what day did you say? Uh, the, the 20, 20 Sunday, the 20, 29th, 29th. 29th. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty far out. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult. Like the, the, for, the, for, like as, as good as like the modeling is these days and as good as Surfline does such a good job. Um, it is really far away. Um, right now it's showing like that, that 29th and 30th being eight to 12 feet with, with some trade winds. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, potentially a lot of, a lot of potential. We've had a crazy run of swell and it looks like the next like 10 days are going to be like pumping. Like right. there's a ton of days in there that's showing like eight to 10 feet, 15 to 20 feet, 10 to 15 feet, 50, 15 to 18 feet. So we got a ton of big waves come in and the really good, um, Thing about that is it looks like by the time the pipe event starts there'll be no sand on the reef whatsoever mm. so that's when you get that classic pipeline you know the, for, for those who haven't ever been to pipeline during the summertime it looks completely different the waves are flat here on the north shore all summer long it's like kind of like a lake and when that happens all of the sand builds up this huge beach this massive beach it's like kind of 250 yards wide and then in the height of the winter, after we get a bunch of swells, that same, instead of being 250 feet wide or yards wide, say, it's only maybe 50 yards wide. And all that sand gets pushed down towards Rocky Point, towards Kupakea and Eukai Sandbar. And that's when you get that classic pipeline conditions where there's no berm on the beach of sand that creates refraction and creates backwash. So that's what I like about that forecast is we're going to have a ton of big waves, meaning most likely we'll have very little sand on the reef and and that creates that kind of epic pipeline kind of conditions right right well we're probably going to get into this a little bit more in the upcoming segment but but to keep it here for a moment you know one of your well-earned nicknames is shane backdorian after the right hander that breaks off the left that's pipeline can you talk to us a little bit just about your career experience at that wave how how old were you when you started to surf it when I started surfing it, I was probably 13. And, and then I moved here to the North shore, like I said, when I was 15 and I became obsessed with, with backdoor, especially, um, like most kids who come to the North shore, especially regular foot kids, they become obsessed with backdoor. It's such a, such a cool wave. And as, and as amazing as it is in the, in the surf videos and stuff like that, even when it's, when it's eight to 10 feet, it looks incredible and you get those crazy rides, but when it's like Grom size, like three to four feet, it's such an epic little Grom barrel and a really cool like training ground for like someone who's 13, 14, 15 years old. So I just, that's all I did was surf pipe and backdoor every day when I was a kid. Yeah. And I just loved it. I fell in love with it. And, uh, you know, my friends that I was peers with and in high school with at the time, we would just surf backdoor as much as we possibly could. And, and to this day, I have a, I've had kind of this crazy up and down relationship, love affair with backdoor pipeline. It's that wave that's like a, it's like a crazy ex-girlfriend that just keeps you coming back. And you're not sure exactly why it's like, maybe it's not the right call all the time, but it's like, when you're out there, you're like, wow, this is why I like this place. It's like, it just brings you back to like being a little kid. And, and, uh, I don't know, there's a lot to fall in love with out there. It's awesome. It, it's interesting you put it in those terms too, because this has actually come up with a lot of CT surfers in, in past episodes of this podcast. And the idea that, of course, when you grow up and you surf, you surf all these different spots. If you're, if you're really good, you get the opportunity to travel around the world and surf even more spots. But everyone kind of has that home break that sits in their heart, you know? And, and you know, you could look at someone like 
John John, who, who grew up there, and that's like his home break, and, and his approach to almost every wave outside of pipe is you can see the foundation is kind of there, and it's obviously served him really, really well. And you could look at someone like, you know, Kolohe and Dino, and, and maybe that's lower trestles or T Street, right? And that's kind of informed his approach. And while you didn't necessarily grow up on the sand at pipe, you were serving it at such a young age, would you say that that, that kind of formed your approach to surfing all sorts of waves or, or is pipeline just so unique that it doesn't really translate? That's a good question. I never really thought about that. I mean, I, my, my home break is in Kona on the big Island. That's, that's, that's where I was born and raised. And my little home break called Banyans is a, is kind of like a high performance little wave. It's kind of like a reefy version of trestles. Hmm. It's, it's pretty kind of like inconsistent and the waves not that great, but it's really fun for kids. Right. Um, and that's kind of where most of my surfing fundamental basis was probably born and, and where like a lot of like my fundamentals are from. So when I was a kid, I was like, a, I was really like more focused on high performance, small wave surfing, uh, you know, a really big day where, where, where I'm from is like pretty much like eight foot faces is kind of like a big swell. Right. So it's not, it's even though it's, I'm from Hawaii, like the waves don't really get very big right where I'm from. So it was such a shock moving to the North shore and surfing pipeline every day and starting to surf sub big sunset beach and stuff. When I was a kid, I was way outside my comfort zone. So it, de it definitely took a while for me to get comfortable with that. Um, but it was a great time in my life. And I was in a, in a really cool group of friends that all push each other in a healthy way. Um, like, you know, the guy, the guys, the guys I was around were very comfortable at a super young age surfing really big white man, really big sunset beach and, and even pipelines. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think the mixture of my home break being like a kind of a rad hot dog, little high performance wave, and then moving to the North shore and getting that kind of heavy wave experience at a really young age, that that's kind of what, kind of what did it for me. Yeah. That's really interesting. You know, when you think about what pipeline and, and backdoor pipeline were like when you started out, compared to now, you know, are there things that over the last 35 years feel exactly the same? And if so, what are those? And are there things that feel different? Maybe it's just the makeup of the lineup or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's pretty darn similar, to be honest. It's more hectic. You can get away with a lot more. Um, like when I was a kid, you would paddle out there and it'd be Johnny Boy Gomes and Dane Kiloha and Marvin Foster and uh, Mickey Nielsen and um, some really heavy local Hawaiian guys that will lock it down. I mean, you couldn't get away. If you were in somebody's way, you were sent in. If you right. were somehow accidentally dropped in on somebody, you were never surfing out there again. Um, so even though people were cool, there was very little room for error. There was a very, very defined pecking order and there were no webcams like right. documenting every single altercation, every every single argument, every single time someone dropped in on somebody or right. every single time someone got knocked out or chased to the beach. So times have changed in that regard for sure. So you can kind of get away with a lot more, which makes the lineup a lot more, you know, there's a lot more traffic out there now. There's a lot more hectic and we've had quite a few people out of pipeline this year, especially that just simply don't, belong out there not in like a hey you're not from here you don't belong right, out right. there but you, you can just tell the ability level the experience level they shouldn't be surfing pipeline they're literally putting other people's lives in danger by being in the way which is kind of crazy and i've seen a huge ramp up this year of a lot more people out there like that that are actually putting your life on the line like you could be a really good pipe surfer paddle out there and get the wave of the day and your life is in jeopardy because people literally don't even know how to duck dive and they're paddling out there on like fishes. So right. that, that, that kind of thing would never in a million years happen in the past. So in that regard, it's a negative, it's, it's busier, it's, it's less structure. There's no, there's a lot less pecking order, but at the same time, you do have solid pipe local boys holding it down guys who do uh, make sure that there is some sort of uh, organization out there. Um, which is cool because it's kind of like the younger guys that are coming up that are like kind of holding it down now. Guys like yeah. um, like like Cole Rothman is really good at like kind of like, you know, him and a bunch of other guys like that are good at like, hey, 
like here's like the front line with the boys who spend the most time out here, local guys who put in the most time mm-hmm. and have worked our way up. And then there's like a, there's like a level down. And, and then when those top guys kind of don't want the wave or they're not in the right spot, those next level down kind of get their choice of the wave. And then there's like another level and another level. And for people who have never served pipeline before, when you paddle out there, you have no idea where those levels are or where you are in the pecking order. Right. And so it's really confusing and, and hard to explain to somebody. But if you surf there a lot, you realize right away where you kind of reside in that pecking order, if that makes sense. Totally. I, I think about this kind of a lot, having watched like the, the injection of social media across society, but obviously within surfing where it felt like when I was younger and I'm, I'm not too much younger than you, but like the reason you'd want to surf anywhere pipe included is like, well, I want to surf to have that experience and get that wave. And, and my input points are who are the people there? Like, who do I need to respect? Like, what are those elements? And it feels like when, you know, a lot of filming came in and when social media came in and social media kind of became a currency it, that didn't matter. You know, it was almost like the experience doesn't matter. Did it get filmed or didn't count? Um, and I kind of think that's tweaked so many, the way so many people treat it, you know, and you've, you've got kids and I'm sure you have to, and I got kids and I'm sure you got to kind of watch that with them too, where it's like, what are the reasons we're doing that? I can't change the world. Like social media is a currency. So if you want to use it, I get that. But like, are you doing things for the right reasons as opposed to maybe putting yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time and kind of destroying something that was, that was working? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, and I think it's, um, I think it's important to have those conversations because I mean, you, you can't change it. We're not going back. Social media right. is here to stay. YouTube is here to stay. Instagram is here to stay. And there's a lot of people out there who feel like they need to be creating content every single session. And you paddle out to back door, uh, you know, with your filmer on the beach, or your camera in your mouth, and you want to be a hero and get the clip for your Instagram. And that when you got hundreds of people like that, who are all watching, these people, people's YouTube channels that are like focusing on pipeline or the North shore and how rad it is and how fun it is, which is true. It just creates this dynamic out there where you get all these people trying to be a hero, trying to get the clip. Um, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a problem with no solution really without right. just having those conversations and kind of like checking people in the water, making sure that it's not a free for all out there because it does, it is like, it's not just, it's not like trestles where it's like a zoo, and it's a nightmare and people get out of hand, but no one's life is on the line. Right. That pipe is completely different. People literally die out there and you, you can die even with no one in your way. When you get two or three people who can't duck die with their board going over the falls with fins and all that kind of stuff, it just creates so much danger. But you're right. I, I really don't know what the solution is with the social media thing, but um, you know, a lot, a lot of guys out there, you know, they're, you know, they're making their livelihoods through, through social media, right. um, you know, a lot of those guys literally like are as soon as they get out of the water, it's they're uploading their vlog to YouTube. They're on TikTok, they're on Instagram, and they have big platforms, and that's how they're making their living. Um, right. You know, and, you know, and and good on them. But you know what that creates is like hundreds of people watching that stuff, going, "Wow, that looks really fun. I kind of want to do that too." Right, and that's a double edged sword, right? You mentioned Kyle Rothman; he's got a huge YouTube channel. Jamie O'Brien's yeah. another one that comes to mind, where it's like. There is a positive in that that funds their commitment to being amazing out at pipe, you know, like without it, it's like they might not have the time or the resources to get as good as they do, but it is, it's not dissimilar to really anything in surfing, whether it's the WSL or, you know, the media or marketing from brands or whatever, where it's like, yeah, we're promoting this act and this lifestyle and these achievements unquestionably people are going to slip into that jet stream and be like, that's better than, you know, being an accountant. I'm, I'm going to try myself. So, um, yeah. You know, I, I know that it's a little bit under the radar, so I don't want to blow up your spot too much, but you, you have lent your experience at Pipe to to some coaching. Um, you know, most notably, I believe it was Idlo Fajera in 2019, where he not only won the event, but but he won the world title in the process. Are you coaching anyone this season heading into the opening championship tour stop? Um, I am. Uh, I'll for, so for pipeline and for sunset, I'll be working for sure with Ethan Ewing and Lakey Peterson. Oh, cool. Um, and I'm doing some work right now with Griffin Colapinto. He's, he's working with, uh, Tommy Whitaker for those events, but like, um, in the lead up to the events, we're doing a bunch of coaching stuff. So 
Yeah, that's something that is funny. I was talking to Griffin this morning. We just got out of the water at sunset, just did a practice session. And uh, he was surfing really well, by the way. Um, and it's just fun. It's really fun to work with these guys. It's incredible that um, I get to work with my favorite surfers on the planet. Like those, those guys are literally my favorite surfers to, to, to watch. Like guys like Italo, Ethan Ewing, uh, Gribicola Pinto, they're my favorite male surfers. Um, so to be able to work with them and bring value to what they're trying to achieve, um, it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's classic because I was talking to Griffin this morning and I told him like, my goal is not to do more coaching. Like coaching is not a goal of mine. It's not something I want to do or need to do, but I feel like I'm good at it. And that sounds super strange, but it's after 40 years of watching this, this particular thing so closely, I have a set of eyes that it's <laughs> like, you know, like my brain is like, has a lot of like data sets in there from all these decades. And so when I see things, I can separate things very easily and like identify weaknesses and strengths and, you know, little, little pockets of places where improvements can be made. And it's fun to be able to bring value to someone who's young and excited and super motivated. Right. And it's interesting. I mean, coaching and surfing is not a new thing, but if you look at it across 2023, there's not really a template, you know, like there's coaches kind of play different roles. And, you know, I remember for years where, where Belly was coaching Kelly Slater on tour and people were like, what is he telling the best surfer on the planet? But then you watch them interact and it's like, he is essential because sometimes you just need a sounding board, you know, for ideas or you need someone to, to communicate something maybe you didn't see, you know, and then there's other coaches that are like hyper-focused on technique and other coaches that are more just kind of operations managers. So it, there's not really one way to do it, but it, it makes sense given the background you've had throughout your career and people coming to Hawaii and being like, yeah, wh why wouldn't I want to tap into some of that experience? Yeah, it's pretty funny because in a way I feel very unqualified because like, look at Italo, like I, he, he hired me because he wanted to win the world title and I never won a world title. So it's <laughs> like, I feel like I'm in a really funny spot of like, <laughs> don't, don't you do these things. Do this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. like, I haven't done it. So like, why would he hire me? But I feel like I, it's so funny that you, you sort of like some of these coaches aren't even like decent surfers whatsoever, but they do bring a lot of value to a top surfer. Mm. Right. Every single surfer kind of needs something different in their lives to help them perform at the very best. So if I can help somebody um, that I enjoy working with and it's a positive um, experience for me personally and it's a positive experience for them, then I have no um, I have no problem doing it. I definitely don't want to do it full time and I don't want right. to do it a ton in the future, but um, I'm enjoying it at the moment. Yeah. Right. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've all seen like elite level surfers that are just complete train wrecks as coaches where you're like, ah, oh, it didn't work out at all. So, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's pipeline, the, the Billabong pro pipeline is CT one. It's now, it's such a tone setter on the schedule, right? Where, you know, you have the world's best surfers are both literally and figuratively being fired out of a cannon to start the season at pipeline. And, you know, there's nowhere yeah. to hide, all eyes are on the opening stop. It's essential to perform there ahead of the mid-season relegation. And it really sets the tone for the race of the Rip Curl WSL finals and the hunt for the world title. So in a way, like Hawaii is almost more important than ever um, with these back-to-back -back stops opening up the season. Yeah, it's funny. A lot of people thought the pressure was off by putting pipe at the start. And, you know, I think the pressure just looks differently because as important as finishing strong is, a strong start is huge. It really kind of defines and sets up your year and it either really builds your momentum. Like if you do well at pipe, it's such a momentum builder. And even more importantly than that, it's such a, it's a confidence builder. Like, you know, if you, if you're winning a, a world title, it's so much of it comes down to your psychology and your confidence. Um, like last year I worked with Ethan Ewing and I really saw a noticeable difference in his confidence level after doing well at pipe. He really, he didn't make it super far at pipe, but he surfed incredibly well. Like it was a major departure for him, like broke some, mm. some serious glass ceilings last year at pipe, like really performed right. well. He looked like a completely different surfer than the years prior. And then at sunset, he went, he went nuts and surfed so confident, so big and strong, um, just surfed exactly to the criteria and so exciting to watch. And it was neat to see that momentum feed into his confidence and his psychology. And then 
I told him, I'm like, dude, this is like, you had such an incredible start. You need to like really carry this confidence. And it's all about psychology. Like you're doing so incredibly well. You need to like, just keep that momentum flowing. Know that the judges love your surfing. Like look at your scores, like look at your heat totals. Um, and I mean that, that can really set you up for the whole year. And the opposite is true as well. Like if you have a shocker in Hawaii, it's, you know, you're falling down the ratings, you're at the bottom. So then you have all these top guys in your heats. Um, your, your psychology is not right. Your confidence is low and it really sets you up for a really tough year. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break, uh, to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. So we, we kind of said it the upfront, like, um, your career has been uh, so robust and diverse. I'm sure we could spend hours and hours talking, but I'm not going to take up your entire day, but y you mentioned you're from the big Island, like, Give us kind of the broad strokes of like, what did mom and dad do? Did you have any siblings? How did you end up on the big island um, at your family? And, and then, and then how'd you get into surfing initially? Whew, that was a long time ago now. Uh, I was actually born in Kona on the big island, the same, the same town that I live in now. I was, I was born and raised in Kona. And my, my dad was from LA and he moved to Hawaii and lived in Honolulu and on Maui throughout the sixties. I think he mm -hmm. moved right after statehood or right before or right after statehood. Uh, right. So right, basically right around that time when Hawaii became a state in the U S. Um, and he met my mom who had just graduated from high school and wanted to go to college at UH Manoa here in Honolulu. And so they met and, um, Long story short, they moved to a little town on the big island called Kona and they had my sister Paige, who's about a year and a half older than me and me so that, you know, we were both born in, in that little town Kona and they started a little restaurant called Dorian's and it was right on the beach. It was kind of like beachfront. Like, so I grew up in that restaurant and there was a little beach there, like kind of like a body surf bodyboard beach. And I, I grew, so I, I, I grew up. I think they got the restaurant when I was about three. And so I learned to swim, learned to body surf, learned to bodyboard, dive fish and surf right there at that beach. So that was kind of like a perfect situation for me. I just fell in love with the ocean when I was like three years old. Um, and when the waves were flat, I go fishing or diving. And when the waves were pumping, I'd go body surfing, bodyboarding. And then for my fifth birthday, my dad had one of his employees cut one of his old balsa boards in half and reshape it for me in like a little long board for me. And, um, and so that's what I learned to surf on when I was five. So, so 10 years between learning to surf on, on the recut balsa board and you deciding, all right, I'm picking up stakes and I'm moving to the North shore at 15 by myself. What, what was the, what was the trajectory? Like, you know, were you just surfing a ton, realizing you're getting good, competing, and just deciding I got to go to Mecca, like that's the North Shore, or or was it just a little less organized than that? Kind of that. I mean, I I just became obsessed with surfing, and it was for me. I you know, without without getting too into details, like my upbringing and was great and everything. I had a great family and all that, but my. My dad, um, like my dad, my dad and my mom split up when I was pretty young and, um, home life was kind of treacherous and stressful for me. And surfing was the thing that kind of saved me. Surfing was the thing that was like my, my escape from being at home. I just didn't want to be in my house at all. And so surfing kind of saved me in that way. And, um, so I spent every minute I possibly could in the water riding waves. And then I started competing. And then I started making it to like the state championships and that was always on Oahu. And so for a couple of years, I went to Oahu to surf these comps when I was like 12, 13 years old. And I, and I became friends with the kids I was competing against people like Jason Megalanis, Maddie Lee, Ross Williams, Keone Watson. And I became really good friends with those kids. And, and they were all saying like, yeah, we're going to become pro surfers. That's, that's, that's what we're going to do. And it was so different. It was such a, completely different mindset for me to be around those kids because they had a lot of exposure to pro surfers. They, right. they would paddle out of Rocky point and see all the best pro surfers back in the day, Derek Ho, Martin Potter, Tom Curran, Tom Carroll, like 
this is back in the eighties. Right. And then where I lived, I never even ever saw a pro surfer in my whole life. And so it just completely changed my mindset. Like, what? You guys are going to be pro surfers? I surf kind of almost as good as you guys. I think I want to do that too. And right. so my friend Jason Megalanis was like, you should move move here and move in with me. And I don't know how to this day, I don't know how I talked mm-hmm. to my mom into it. My mom was super strict. My mom, super hard worker, really disciplined, would never in a million years let me like skip school because the waves were good. That was just not an option. And somehow I... I convinced her that moving to the North Shore was something that was legit. And she was amazing in lying to the school system, telling them that I was that she was gonna move here with me and that she was just like tying up loose ends and that she was gonna move here with me. And I I was just staying with friends for now and she was gonna be here in a couple of weeks. We did that four years in a row. Um, and I ended up living on the North Shore and that was, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, I, I, I sort of wanted to do what my friends wanted to do. My friends wanted to become pro servers. And I just thought that that was, wow, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that that was even an option. So it just made me work super hard and um, poured kind of all my energy and, and time into surfing. That's interesting. You know, the, the part you're saying about, you know, you didn't have that much exposure to, to professional surfing in, until you moved to the North Shore, certainly not compared to some of your contemporaries. Like, that's something I'm, I'm really fascinated by, especially now, right? Because it's the information age now, like anyone can go on YouTube and like watch the Blueprint or watch a WSL webcast. And it's sort of this democratization of access to information for up and coming kids, right? Like, the shapers, they, they have all the same information, like diets, the same, like trainings, the same. They could watch Gabriel Medina or Stephanie Gilmore or Griffin Colapinto or whoever they want, like right away. But when you were young, when I was young, like your exposure to world-class surfing was kind of limited to the best surfer at your beach, right? <laughs> Where you're like, that's yeah. what I got, you know, like, and maybe a VHS tape eventually. But you you, you have such a defined and unique style in your own surfing. And and I'd imagine you're analytical enough to say whether that was there from the beginning or not. But I'm wondering for your own kind of surfing, is that something that you feel like that, that style and that approach, was that there from the beginning when you were on Kona or is that something that morphed once you got to the North shore and started seeing different kinds of surfing? I think a little bit of both. I, I was, mm. when I was young, say around thir- 12, 13 years old, I became really obsessed with Tom Curran. And as I tried very, very, very hard for years to mimic his surfing and to basically surf exactly like Tom. My, one of my, but I became so obsessed with Tom that my mom got it worried about me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember she was like, you really got to be careful, like putting people up on pedestals because they'll let you down type of deal. Cause I was just like such a Tom Curran worshiper. My, one of my best friends, John Petrie at the time made me this VHS tape that had like six Tom Curran movie segments cut back to back. So it was like all these like, you know, cutouts from different movies all back to back. It was like an hour long movie of just Tom Curran segments. And I would get home from school and this is kind of scary, but I had like this stand up mirror in my room. And I would put the, on, on the TV, I would put my Tom Curran videotape and I would put the mirror there and I would sit there and I would try to copy his, I would put in slow-mo and try to copy his arms, his legs, his hips, his, how he would squat on his bottom turn, how he'd compress off the top. And I'd basically try and completely copy his surfing. And then I get so fired up and paddle out and go surfing. And, and, um, yeah, I mean, I tried, re- I never ended up surfing like Tom Curran, but he was a massive influence on my approach and my technique. And, um, I, I just was a major Tom Curran fan. So I, there's probably some elements in there for sure that my style got better because I was like watching Tom Curran trying to emulate him. But at the same time, there's, there's, there's only so much you can do and still be functional. You know, I think there's sometimes when people get too worried about their style and it actually works where it becomes not functional and they get so styly that, it's not, it doesn't even work, you know? And there's a, right. the, the flip side, not to go off on a tangent, but the flip side right. is like, say a guy like Italo, he looks like he's never seen a surf video in his life. Right. Like to me, when I watch surf videos of Italo, it looks like he, someone like raised him with a really good surfboard shaper on a, on a deserted island and just let him surf all day long. He just has such an unusual approach, unusual 
style just looks so instinctive and natural um, and exciting. Even the way he stands on a surfboard, he's like not back footed and he's, he does all this stuff that is like, doesn't really make sense from like a conventional style standpoint. But right. I think that's what makes him so exciting to watch and so refreshing, you know? That's really interesting. You know, obviously like Tom Curran is, it doesn't really need an introduction, but when you were a young kid, what was it that drew you to him as like sort of a singular influence? Was it just his surfing? Was it, you know, his competitive um, achievements? Was it kind of the mythology of Tom Curran or a combination there? And I'm wondering if it was one thing or the other, if, if maybe, you know, you were only exposed to the surfing and just to your young eyes, you were like, I like, that looks nice. You know, I'd like to surf like that. I mean, it was mostly, it was mostly surfing style was so unique at the time he was so it was like he was 30 years ahead of anybody else at that time it was him and aki really it's it it was like they were from the future their technique and like their power base and their u- utilization of speed and all that was just incredible um yeah and so yeah i mean he, i just he looked so much better than anyone else at the time it was almost like john john these days like the way kids, the way like every kid wants to surf like John John or Ethan Ewing, because right. their style is 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 it's very similar to that. Except when Tom Curran was there, it was like almost there was no one else. You know, and it's 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 interesting too. You bringing Italo into that conversation too, because it kind of sounds like, yeah, you can look at a surfer like a Carissa Moore or a Joel Parkinson or an Andy Irons and go. I want to surf like that person. Like I'm going to, I'm going to obsess on, on every, like the way their hands look when they're doing that turn, the way their hips are, as you pointed out. But if you overdo it, you get boxed in and you don't actually have that freedom to be creative and, and to, to advance what they were doing. Right. And, 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 you know, you mentioned Italo, like, you know, another one that comes to mind is like Gabriel in a way, like, like, especially out at somewhere like Chopu, like, the equipment he's riding and like how early he's getting into these waves. And it's like, it, it's amazing when it, because you feel like surfing's kind of plateaued sometimes where you're like, that's people will never surf better than whoever, Andy, Kelly, whatever it is. And then you're like, no, that person took that and then did something new as you mentioned, John. And it's, it's just really exciting when that happens. For sure. And it's, it's neat how, you know, each generation kind of builds on the, on, on the previous generation that influenced them so much. Like, when you look at the generation of like Joel Parkinson, Mick Fanning, even Kelly Slater, you can see like this new generation, like John, John and Griffin and Ethan Ewing and, you know, sort of that, that age group that has grew up watching Joel and Mick. But so they have that fundamental base of like that really beautiful rail game, but then they're like really incorporating like all this stuff that Joel and Mick really never were doing. So right. it just makes it so exciting for like a surf fan to see the evolution happening so quickly and that innovation like really taking off. Yeah. So a few years after you moved to the North shore, we'd, we'd mentioned it in the first segment, but you sign with, with Billabong at 18. What were the general bones of that contract? Like, and I'm not asking for numbers or anything, but more like we are signing Shane Dorian to win a world title or we're signing him to be a CT can, competitor or signing him to be a big wave guy. What, what was the idea around that first contract with Billabong with you? Well, I mean, I was 18 years old and, and at the time, to be quite honest, like I was kind of an underperformer. I was probably at the lower end of my peer group. I had not, hadn't really done anything yet. I really, I just started competing. I, I, I just graduated high school. I was um, my really good friend. He was like an older brother to me. His name is Todd Chesser. He was competing on the on the PSAA, which was like a regional US pro tour back in the day. And he was like, hey, come and live with me in San Diego um, and compete in a bunch of these pro events. So as soon as I graduated, I moved to California, basically lived on his couch and started competing right away. But I really didn't have a whole lot of success. And just based off like my performances in Hawaii and based on like just me just really trying to, to make the most of it and sh- I guess showing some potential. Um, Bob Hurley and Paul Gomez, who were running Billabong at the time, just, you know, kind of took a shot with me. I, mm. I got paid a very nominal amount of money that first year. They said that they couldn't afford anything else. It, it, here, here's like a little paycheck. And at the time, I just couldn't believe I was getting paid to go surfing. 
um, it was barely enough. If, I don't even think it was enough to survive monthly, right. but, um, but you know, they said, Hey, if you do really well, you have a lot of potential here. There's the sky's the limit for you. And right. so it, that just lit a fire that they, that, you know, that they believed in me and I, and shout out to Paul Gomez and, and Bob Hurley for really believing in me and giving me that initial shot. And then, cause it wasn't long after that to where I, I started kind of like overperforming for myself, um, started competing really well. I, I went from like being a terrible competitor and a really bad small wave surfer, to be quite honest. Um, I started learning how to surf small waves a whole lot better. I started getting really good boards and I started building momentum and, and next thing I know, I, I, I qualified for the world tour when I was 20 and, um, started competing on the world tour and kept signing contracts with Billabong. And, you know, my, my value kept going up a whole lot more and, and, and they responded in a really cool way and just kept supporting me. And was, I've never really wavered since it's been, been an amazing run with those guys. They've, they've always had my back and supported me. And probably the biggest thing was, um, that really stands out was like, I had a really great run on the on the world tour and and my value was really kind of like redetermined every year by my rankings my standings on the tour how close i was to winning a world title and at a certain age i kind of like 2004 i became really burnt out actually the last the 2003 2004 became really burnt out and kind of stopped wanting to compete i i it was funny i would be out in heats that were really important and I would have the same exact emotion if I lost is, is if I won mm. and that's not a good place to be. And I just couldn't mm. find my motivation. I couldn't find that fire anymore. And I just knew I was like, just really mentally not there. And it really bummed me out that I, that I couldn't get there. And, um, I just felt like I wasn't like really hitting my potential as a surfer. I wasn't doing what I really should be doing. And so I, I really took a step back and, and looked at what I really wanted to do. And what I really wanted to do was chase huge waves and mm. uh, work with people. I, I wanted to like make movies and and really pursue big waves and really heavy, heavy waves. I had, I had some really big goals and dreams uh, with pursuing massive waves. Yeah. It, things that I hadn't done before and I felt like I had the potential to like really, really uh, kind of like break through my own glass ceiling personally. And, when I approached Billabong about quitting the tour and pursuing this other thing, they really, it was a huge leap of faith for them, you know, and I, I, I got to give them a lot of credit for supporting me at that point. Right. I mean, it's so interesting to hear you talk about that too, because you know, like nineties and oddies, the time period, it, it felt so much more wild west within the industry compared to today where everything's sort of like commodified and quantified relative to what it was then. You know, and, and I remember like hearing Kelly talk about competing when he was younger. And, and I think people forget, like people weren't paid that well. You know, I remember him being like, oh, we used to talk about, we had like a shitty condo and I'd talk with my friend. I'm like, if we get through one more heat, that's like a couch for the condo, you know, As, and like, it's kind of insane to think like, you know, Gabriel or John thinking that where like, if I get through another heat, I can have a couch to sit on in my, in my condo. Um, but that's kind of how it was back then. And, and to your point, like, there were so many options for pro surfers in the sense of, yes, there was the tour. Yes, there were world titles happening, but then there was also, you know, Taylor Steele and the momentum generation and film projects. And for a few years there, it was, you know, I think the industry and I think the market really responded to that, those options and saying like, yeah, maybe the final segment in a Taylor Steele movie is as important as a world title. Um, now that's, that's kind of was my experience as an outsider, but you were actually in it. Is that fair or accurate from, from, from your experience? No doubt. I mean, mm. it was at a time when there wasn't that much content out there, like for the yeah. kids watching this, you know, it's unfathomable to think of a time where you weren't scrolling through hundreds of feeds in five right. minutes of people's content, just like from yesterday at backdoor, like 50 clips or yesterday at Trestles, 50 clips. Like what, what was Trestles like? Oh, just look at Kaloha and Dino's feed and all these other guys' feeds that all surf lowers every day and they all put out clips every day. It just wasn't like that back in the day. So to paint a picture, you basically saw no surfing all year. And then this Taylor Steele movie, everybody knew was gonna come out in like one month. And it was so cool to be part of that with guys like Kelly Slater, Rob Machado, Ross Williams, Taylor Knox, Pat O'Connell, Kalani Rob, uh, Greg Browning, like, we had so many rad surfers back in the day that were all like part of this friend group. And then Taylor Steele was 
one of our best friends as well and just happened to like love to make films. Right. And so we kind of all grew up together. And for those who saw Momentum Generation, you kind of know the story, but that was a really neat time because it was, it was like a huge evolution in surfing. Like really the only game in town when we started was like getting on the world tour, winning world titles, making the top right. 10. And then all of a sudden you had all this value from like making movie parts. And that was like so much fun and to be creative in those ways and to really work on something that you were proud of. And it, it, you're right. I mean, if you had like the last three segments in, in Taylor Steele's uh, movies and there were banger parts, they resonated with kids. Like every kid in the world wanted to surf like you if you had the last part. Right. Um, and it was like a hit. Like people watch those movies thousands of times the next year. Oh, yeah. And so it, it's really neat to see like all like the kind of roller coaster ride that surfing's gone through. Um, but yeah, do you, I don't know how, if I answered that question. But No, 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 that was perfect. I, but, but my follow up was going to be, do you think part of that dynamic, even a small part of that dynamic of like, you know, maybe, maybe filming and getting, you know, one of the last three segments in a Taylor movie is my focus. Do you think part of that for your generation in particular was a function of Kelly was just so competitively dominant, you know, like we have this, like, we kind of joke yeah. about on our side where it's like, he was like the next best thing in surfing for 30 years. And surfing is this like community obsessed with the cult of youth. It's really paradoxical, but like, you know, in a way, like, it's like, well, Jesus, like Kelly's such a competitive freak. Like the opportunity for me is to kind of put together this incredibly well-rounded video part in addition to competing on tour, but like, I've got a shot at this compared to Kelly and the world title. Was, did that ever kind of play into it for you? Yeah, I never thought about it in that way, but yeah, it was like almost impossible to compete with Kelly on a, on a competitive level. Like he was miles away in his surfing ability. He was miles away with heat structure. He was miles away at like handling pressure. He really had no equals uh, for 20 years. Yeah. So he would just almost win all the time. Uh, even though if he didn't prepare, even though if he wasn't ready, even though he show up five minutes late for his heat, he just dominate. He just dominate. Right. Um, and so I guess it was like for people who wanted to see more than just Kelly, those Taylor Steele films were really cool because it really painted the picture of like, hey, this is like a group of people who have really funny characters and right. they have like these lives or they're traveling and they're documenting them for the first time ever. Like you really get to like see behind the scenes of all the travel and the friendships and like the ups and downs and you know what these kids are going through so i i just think it was so refreshing and new at that point to kind of like is for the first time ever you really saw like pro service personality types which is which will never get old you know i think that's why social media is so popular is you get to see like you know what nathan florence is doing like almost every minute of the day like you get right. you get to like know these people like like jamie o'brien like those guys do such a good job of like letting people in and, and really getting to know them. So when kids see Jamie O'Brien in the street, they run up and like want to hug him and be like, what's up, Jamie? Yeah, let's get psyched. <laughs> like it's like when I saw Tom Curran, I was just like awestruck, like, oh my God, right. I just saw a ghost. But when they see Jamie O'Brien, they literally never met him before. They run up and like want to be on his vlog. Like right. there's like this inclusiveness that is so new and so fun. And I think that's a really exciting thing about this this time is like you're really able to connect with people who who are psyched on surfing now do you personally look at that and think oh, i wish that was around when i was coming up or are you kind of like whoo that's exhausting i'm glad i didn't have to do that when i was coming up it's a little bit of both to be honest right, yeah. um i mean i think the kids are really lucky in this day and age to have different options to these mm. these different platforms that like when, when I was a kid, to put it in perspective, when, when I was like, say, 18, 19 years old, if you wanted people to know who you were in the surfing world, you kind of had to work the angles with surf magazines. Right. You had to become friends with photographers. You had to like call them incessantly. Hey, where are you going to shoot tomorrow morning? Hey, it's going to be good. Where are you going to be? Please call me. And yeah. then you had to like chase down these photographers and then like hopefully their photo editors pick your photo to be in the magazine. And if you dropped in on the wrong photo editor or somehow didn't know the writer and, and you said something bad and the, the writer didn't like you, you were toast right. and you were just clipped. Like you had no power, basically. You just had to kind too, of kiss, kind kiss of a like, lot of ass. Yeah. Too many gatekeepers back then. There was a lot of gatekeepers and the, yeah. the, and I feel like the, I feel like the, uh, 
like the like the playing fields leveled now. Like, you know, like look at like Bronson Mady. He's like such a perfect example. Um, Bronson's a kid from a little island in Indonesia where people pretty much have nothing, and he yeah. grew up, you know, like living on a dirt floor, literally. And he's a full on surf star. It's because he has a platform. Like, if you're a kid from anywhere in the world, if if you have a couple of video clips and you have incredible talent, everyone in the world is going to know about you that day, which right. is it's, it's so, so fun. Like everyone's going to share your content, which is really neat. So there's less gatekeepers. There's more freedom. There's a lot more power for each person to kind of control what they're doing. And, you know, like a guy like Nathan Florence is like a really good example of that. Like he's really mm. harnessed that opportunity and ran with it. And he's having a lot of fun. You know, he's like living his dream. He works crazy hard. The, yeah. you know, like, don't get it twisted. I'm friends with Nathan. I know how hard he works. He's constantly yeah. working, but he's having the time of his life, you know, building an incredible career and really taking the power back. And he, and just, um, it's super inspiring just to see someone, uh, and he's not the only one, but just kind of taking advantage of the different platforms and different opportunities and not just going, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a pro tour guy. I guess I'm going to have to get a, a different job, you know? Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense. You know, Tracking back to what you're saying about, you know, not having the motivation to compete on the championship tour anymore and, and working with, you know, your, your supporters on, I want to go chase big waves. Is that, it, it's interesting, like even kind of getting to rewatch the blueprint in advance of this, like there's so many good snippets and there's even a moment where like Taj Burrow is on there and he kind of quietly admits like Shane's like the gnarliest guy on tour when it gets heavy. It, it sounds like heavy waves and big waves were something that was always something for you. It wasn't just like, okay, I'm done with the CT. Now I'm going to kind of push into this space. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, everybody thinks I just started surfing big waves when I stopped doing the tour. But, <laughs> right, yeah. I, um, you know, when I, when I was living on the North Shore during high school, I really had a lot of exposure. I lived with Todd Chester and Brock Little, who was already in the Eddie I Cow when I was in high school. And so he was, a, you know, uh, Brock Little was a huge mentor to me. He was like an older brother. He, when the waves were big, he'd be like, you're not surfing reforms. You're coming with me. We're surfing the outer reefs. We're surfing Waimea. And so I had exposure to those really big waves at a really young age, 16, 17 years old. And so by the time I was 19, 18, 19, I was surfing 20 foot swells all every single time. And then when I qualified for the tour, I just had a lot less time on my hands. I was competing nonstop on the QS and the CT. So I just had a lot less time. So I wasn't able to chase swells to Mavericks. I wasn't around for big white mana swells very often. Um, and so that kind of got put on hold for like 12 years of my life. Right. Even though w when I was on the North shore competing and I was here for the tour, I would take every single chance to surf pipeline or big sunset or any heavy waves I possibly could. But yeah. so that never died. The fire never died of surfing really big waves. It just kind of like was on pause for a while. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, I've noticed that there's, there's generally kind of two camps when it comes to surfers at almost any level. Right. And it's like, there's the one camp that's like, I'm into surfing and I'm just going to, I'm just going to obsess about surfing and my, my circle is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's, it gets very, very insular. And then there's another camp that's like, well, surfing is kind of a window to all these other things, you know, and I'm, I'm, my circle's getting bigger and maybe it's not as intense or as deep, but like, I'm meeting different kinds of people and, and I'm getting interested in different kinds of things. And, you know, there's all these dimensions to your surfing, but then there's other parts of your life, like, you know, whether it's sort of your commitment to, to fitness or, or hunting, like these are kind of dimensions of your life that you, you, it seems like you de dedicate a lot of time to it, but it all kind of works together. It's not like you're abandoning one thing for another thing. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, so basically my whole life was the tour for a long, long time, for about 12 years, just constant competing every single week in a different country, chasing points. And then, you know, we, we decided to have kids, my, my wife, Lisa and I. And so at that time I was like, Hey, I need to be around for, you know, for, for, I want to, I want to be here for this kind of this whole year, like while she's mm -hmm. pregnant, you know, so I kind of hung at home a lot. And at that time I started getting into archery and I started bow hunting because I was home all the time. And the waves, sometimes waves are flat. And I had a couple of friends who were bow hunters, got into bow hunting 
and um, fell in love with it. It was very similar to surfing. Like right. for, for me, like bow, everyone thinks bow hunting is, is uh, I guess people have, everyone has their own assumptions and I did too before I started bow hunting. Um, but it's, it's amazingly fun. Honestly, it's very similar to surfing. Like the reasons I surf now is because I get to be out in nature. I get to be out in the sunshine. I get to go out and like de-stress, like bring my stress levels down, lower my heart rate, mm-hmm. you know, hang with my friends, have a social life, you know, be, be around and do things, be active, get exercise. All those things, every single one of those boxes are ticked by bow hunting as well for me. Right. I just like, I'm just carrying a bow in the mountains instead of being out there with my surfboard. I like half the time, I don't even draw my bow back at an animal. I just want to go like hiking all day in the mountains and see mm-hmm. a beautiful place and go see waterfalls or mountains or, or, you know, high deserts or whatever it is. And it's, it's been a really fun thing in my life to find a passion, um, like later on in life that I, that I really love to do. And then, and now it's pretty funny because my, my family, especially my wife, Lisa, she's very health conscious. She wants to know where her food is coming from, whether it's shopping at farmer's markets or now she's putting a ton of pressure on me to go kill a bunch of deer. So she has fresh organic, um, meat in the freezer at all times. Cause that's what she feeds me and my kids. So, I mean, I eat venison five days a week, literally, but even more than that. Um, and, and my wife does too, and my kids do as well. So it, there's a lot of synergy there and it's, and that's been really cool too. The, the bow hunting side of things is things is kind of funny because for me, it was like this passion and hobby to, to, to get good at. It. And I really like love to do it aside from surfing. And it's led to amazing opportunities to travel. Um, right. You know, I, I have a partnership with Yeti who yep. makes products that really uh, align with my surfing life, my bow hunting life, my fitness life. Like it's it's been really fun to, to work with brands that aren't like endemic surf brands who right. really love surfing. They love the lifestyle. They love surfers. And and, and what we represent. So, and th- that's been really cool to kind of bring those worlds together. For sure. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that I saw like a magazine where you were in, you know, drawn back or something in your gear and I'm like, Oh yeah, it's cool. He's got this other activity. But I remember I, I listened to the one, of, maybe it's just the one, but the Joe Rogan podcast. And I'm like, Oh, Shane Dorian's on there. And I listened to it and it was all about bow hunting. And I was listening to it being like, this guy, this guy fucking knows what he's talking about. Like, I had no idea that it was that big a part of your life. And, you know, the more I talk to people about just kind of their other activities in addition to surfing, like someone brought up a really good point. They said, you know, like surfing for a lot of people, whether they realize it or not, is a meditation in the sense that it's, it's a, your mind is focused on one act, you know, like it's so all encompassing that all the noise of life, like your phone or, you know, news or whatever, it's like, you have to focus so much on this one thing that it's really cathartic for, you know, your mind and your body and everything else. And they're like, it could be anything, you know, it could be rock climbing. It can be like actual just sitting yeah. in yoga and it could be bow hunting, you know? And it's like, I, I don't think people give that kind, that kind of stuff enough credit where it's like finding anything where you can just focus on one thing is so good, even for the other stuff in your life, you know? Well, it's like, it's, it's even like, you know, say, say you work a nine to five and you get off work and you're just tired and stressed out and you, you all you want to do is just grab your board shorts or your wetsuit and your surfboard and go surf and just paddle down the beach where there's no one around and just sit there you don't even have to catch a wave yeah. you just watch the sunset you know and it's like for anybody who can relate to that that is if you can find that in your life you can find that in your life to to bring you stress relief to lower your heart rate to help you sleep well at night um just there's so many amazing things that nobody even thinks that to, to associate with surfing. Everyone thinks it's all about riding waves, but mm. the lifestyle, like what, what it brings to your, your soul and your energy and your health, like um, your physical health, your psychological health, not to get all cosmic, but it, there's so many cool things about surfing that nobody ever really thinks about. But for me, that's, that's, that's why I really, really love to surf. Cause I feel like I'm a much healthier person because of surfing, like psychologically, mentally, physically, uh, in every single way, there's no real downside at all to surfing. So for sure, that's that's why I think I'm still so in love with it. Well, and as you were saying too, like 
it, for you, it's become less of an insular thing where it's like, you know, your, your circle's gotten so much bigger and there's different dimensions to it. And, and you can go surfing, you can go, you can be working on, on your, your physical health, you can go bow hunting. And, and I'm sure that the people in your life have become that much more diverse because of that. You know, you mentioned your partnership with Yeti, but like they have an entire ambassador group of people that have nothing to do with surfing, but that's just a cool kind of input into your life. And you'd be a cool like counter input to theirs, right? In a lot of ways. Yeah, it's funny. I've, I've done a bunch of Yeti hunting trips. So it's mm. funny, like being sponsored by Billabong, I've done a million. Um, thank, thankfully, I've done tons of amazing like boat trips and surf trips around the world. Like I, I, I did boat trips with, with a ton of them with like Andy Irons and, and Dave Rastovich and Taj Burrow and Joel Parkinson. And they're all like these crazy memories, like throughout, throughout my surfing history. And I'm grateful for every single one of those experiences. And it's been amazing on the other side to like do Yeti trips. Like, like the guys from Yeti will call me up and be, Hey, what are you doing in September? Let's do a trip. And I'm like a uh, surf trip. And they're like, no, we're going elk hunting in Utah or elk hunting in, um, you know, Montana or Wyoming or whatever it is. And I've done trips with, um, I've done trips with Keith Malloy, who's a surfer, who's also a Yeti ambassador. Uh, Mark Healy is a Yeti ambassador that does hunting trips with us. And, um, you know, uh, Matt Miola, who is an incredible surfer is also a, yeah. a super talented bow hunter. Yeah. And so it's really neat that these worlds are kind of like intertwined now. And a lot of people are seeing that you really don't only have to be a surfer. And, you know, for a lot of these kids that are like incredibly talented at surfing, they get so hyper focused on surfing because they kind of have to to get become that right. high, high level. And I just hope that they find something that they're really passionate about for when things start calming down in the surf world, they have something else they feel really passionate about because it is easy to become depressed at the end of your pro surfing career. It's like the highs are so high from surfing. Mm. They really truly are like, yeah. you're the guy for a long time. Like all these kids want your autograph. Everybody wants a selfie with you. Everybody's watching your, your Instagram or whatever. And then when things calm down and maybe you're not in the top 10 or anymore, you get, you're not on the tour anymore. All of a sudden you have to get a real job and like, yeah. unless you have something you're really passionate about, you're really in love with something totally different or you, your real passion for surfing hasn't gone away, then you might be in some trouble. Are there kind of like noticeable, like atmospheric differences between like a hunting trip and a surf trip? And, and if so, do you and, you know, Keith and Matt kind of giggle about him? Like a, a comparison I bring up is I was talking to John about uh, climbing, you know, the other day, cause I recently got into it and I said, you know what, like I love surfing. I'm never going to not love surfing, but you're dealing with a finite resource, right? There's a wave and then it's gone. And so everyone out there is kind of like, yeah, we're friendly enough, but I want that wave. I said, you go to like, you go climbing and the rock's always there. So like every, the temperature is much lower amongst everybody. Everyone seems just kind of more casual, but I'm wondering if there's any kind of main differences on, on between your surf trips and your climb, hunting trips. Um, that's interesting. That's probably the, the, the place where it's really, really, really differs. Like, cause like with hunting, I'm not competitive with anybody, mm. but I get really envious of people who are much better hunters than me. So I'm not competitive with them. Like, Oh, you got something I didn't not like that. It's more like it, with hunting, it's kind of like golf where like, it's really, especially with bow hunting. Like there's so many things it's hard to explain to a non hunter, a non, especially a non bow hunter. But like if things come together, like, and you actually make a perfect shot on an animal and you get to clean it and get to eat it and it's in your freezer and everything's perfect and it's a huge success. Like hundreds of things seemingly have to go right. And there's some people like I, I have a couple of friends, like my buddy, Justin, that I hunt with all the time. He's so good at hunting that I hate being friends with him. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. He's like being friends with Kelly and going surfing. You're like, you right, really, yeah. did you really just get that wave? Did you really just do that crazy air? Like my, my, I have buddies like that who hunt where I'm like, what? How did you do that? Like, really? We're, weren't we just together? And then all of a sudden, like it all happened for you and not for me, or you made all these great decisions that I didn't. So the, in a, I guess in a certain way, it is seems sort of competitive, but I, it's like with bow hunting, especially because the, there's an animal involved and you want to make a really ethical shot. Mm. You, you, you want, you want to be successful in bringing home meat for your family, right? You want to be successful in having a great experience out there and not a negative one for you and for the animal. 
So you want it to be as good as possible. Um, and so you get really focused on absolutely making the perfect shot or waiting for the perfect opportunity, you know, being very patient. And, and, and sometimes you have to, you know, sometimes you're sitting there and you're within range, within bow range, and an animal lays down behind some trees or some brush. It's not an ethical shot. Like you might, you might have a shot at its body, but it's not the perfect spot. And mm. it takes a lot to just sit there and be like, well, I'm not going to shoot in the wrong spot. I'm just going to sit here. And then all of a sudden the wind blows the wrong way and the animal gets up and runs after three hours of waiting. That happens literally all the time. That's like a standard thing for bow hunting. And so if, if you get frustrated by those types of things, you either hate bow hunting or you really need something like bow hunting to teach you patience. Right, right, right. And is that like the patience thing? Is that, is that something that you, you feel like you brought into the, the sport when you started doing it? Or is that something that you learned? Maybe it's a bit of both. First of all, surfing, I mean, uh, bow hunting is definitely not a sport. Is that what you're talking about? Oh bow yeah. Hunting? Sorry. I, I, I didn't want to say activity, but like, you know, that I guess yeah. it's just no, that know, part of your you life, mean. you know? Yeah. People call it that all the time, but for me, it's just like a, I don't know what it is. It's like, you know, it's, it's not un, unlike like rock climbing or, or hiking or just something that, you know, I'm passionate about that brings me joy. But, um, but yeah, I think the patience It's funny because I have pretty severe ADHD, especially when I was a kid hmm. and I was, so I was very, very, very impatient when I was a kid, like really hyperactive and kind of skitzing out all the time very little patience, but over the years I've learned to become pretty darn patient, especially I think surfing has helped me to learn patience, you know, being out of pipeline, you can't be very impatient. You have to, you know, if, if you're impatient and you're a surfer, you go surf pipeline and it'll teach you patience. Yeah. You know, sometimes you sit out there for three, four hours and only catch one wave. And so when I found bow hunting, um, not to keep talking about bow hunting, no, no, I've never enjoyed aren't it. that yeah. interested, but yeah, I mean, I, I think being patient is a huge part of my success with bow hunting. Like, I don't mind at all, you know, hunting for three or four days and not getting a single shot opportunity. Like it, just being out there in nature, seeing beautiful places, getting exercise, walking around, taking naps under trees. Sometimes I, I, sometimes I spend two or three hours just looking for the perfect tree to take a nap under and have lunch. Um, I just thought like, like those, like when I'm, when I'm 90 years old and I'm looking back at my life, I'm not going to regret a single day of bow hunting. I love it. We, uh, we're going to take one more break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. You know, we, you, you mentioned your kids, you get you know, Jackson and Charlie and, and they're must be, you know, teenager ish. And I mean, I remember like working on tour and working on the big wave tour and, and actually having the honor of like seeing a lot of your insane big wave accomplishments in the flesh. And I, and I remember pretty vividly, after some of those moments, you were kind of saying, you know, I, with my kids and my life and, and I, I don't feel the internal pressure to have to continue to push it in this realm. It's so dangerous and we're, we're so well beyond the horizon of what people have done in the past that I, I'm comfortable with, with what I've done. I'm still going to pursue it, but, but maybe not that intensely. Is, is that something you still wrestle with as a father or you, do you feel like you're kind of more comfortable with where you're at and you're surfing and, and just chasing crazy waves like that? You know, I think I'm there. I think mm. I'm, I'm kind of right where I'm supposed to be. I mean, I always like, I'm pretty, I, I'm always trying to think of where I should be in the future, kind of mm. like make a two year plan, three year plan, five year plan, 10 year plan. And, and so when I was like in my late thirties and, and even early forties, I was really planning on being kind of totally done surfing really huge waves by the time I was 45. Right. Um, I just thought, I felt like that was a cutoff date for me personally. And I never really knew if I was going to be successful in doing that because I had like this crazy, crazy desire to chase every single epic swell around the world. And I needed to like every swell I could get the wave of my life. I was so obsessed with that. Like I need to get, I'm, I need to be there or else what if the wave of my life comes in and I'm not there and mm. I just had the craziest FOMO. Um, and luckily I had caught some incredible waves, kind of waves I never thought in a million years I would catch in my lifetime. And when I stack those up and look back on them, I cannot believe that I was 
there in position and like in the right mindset mentally and physically and all that stuff to, to make that stuff happen. And I'm really proud of that. On, to, to be quite honest, I'm really proud of what I achieved surfing big waves. And, and I think that's what's given me a clear conscious and like a happy heart to be on the other side of it now and like look mm. back and be like, wow, I should be proud of that. I should be proud of like the decade and a half that I really dedicated to surfing the biggest waves I possibly could. And I lived through it and some people weren't that lucky, you know, and yeah. I had a lot of good friends pass away surfing big waves. And, mm. um, I feel incredibly grateful to be here with my family and be happy on the other side of that and not chasing 80 foot jaws anymore, not chasing 80 foot Mavericks anymore, still being happy to challenge myself surfing big cloud break and big sunset and good sized pipeline. I've been surfing this year. And mm. it's funny because when I'm out there, I still have the ability level. I still have the right mindset to surf really big waves. And if someone put me out at Jaws on a really good new board and a big wave came to me, I'm not going to paddle over it. I'm going to go. Mm. I'm still there for sure. I yeah. could definitely be doing it. There's no doubt. It's not like I can't do it. I just, I know I need to take myself out of the equation is what it is. So I've done that and I'm happy with that decision. And my family's happy with that decision. I, you know, I kind of drove my wife crazy for a decade. You know, she had a lot of stress that she never really shared with me, hmm. but she, you know, she would cringe every time I left. She thought, yeah. you know, there's a chance this guy's not coming back. Right. And then when I had kids, it's a lot of pressure, you know? So yeah, yeah, I feel really, really happy and grateful to be where I am and be at a place where I feel, um, 100% confident that I'm doing the right thing. That's really good to hear. I, I was going to ask too, and you brought it up, so I'm, I'm glad you did, but you know, we have so many people that listen to this podcast. We've, we talk to a lot of, you know, not even just big wave surfers, just like high level surfers. And it can be such a destabilizing lifestyle, right? Where you're, you're here, you're gone, you're here, you're gone. And so, you know, for someone like yourself, where you were chasing these swells and you had this hunger and you had a young family, like it, it was it tense, right? In the sense of like, not only am I leaving at the drop of a hat sometimes, but I'm leaving to do something incredibly dangerous. And, and you mentioned your wife has sort of recently shared the stress of that, but, but I guess for like listeners and other kind of big wave surfers out there, what, what would you say to them in the sense of like, no, it's not always perfect and you can't expect people to like be okay with that kind of like constant um, destabilizing mechanism in people's lives. Yeah. I mean, I think people are going through it, you know, I mean, and surfing really big waves is like a, a labor of love. Like it's, mm. you, it's very few people getting paid well to surf big waves. It's not right. a thing. I mean, like Billy Kemper is at the very top of what he's doing. And so is Kyle Lenny. And like, they're the very best big wave surfers in the world right now. Mm. Um, but both of them have children and they're dads now, and they have great wives in their lives. Like Billy Kemper's like been through some insanely, close calls and nearly dying a couple times and his wife Tahiti has been there every step of the way, just rock solid supporting him. But it takes its toll, you know, over time. It was funny. A couple years ago, I was surfing with Billy and he was like, God, how did you stop surfing jaws? I don't get it. How do, how do you see a swell on the forecast and not go? And it was a great question. And, and to be honest, like I just, I was like, man, Billy in, 20 years, I'm going to call you up and I'm going to ask you how you do it. And you're going to have the same exact question. Ho hopefully in a perfect world, you're going to have the exact same answer as I do. And you'll just know that it's the right time. You know what I mean? And you got a great wife, great family. And you'll realize that like, you know, that time in your life should be in the rearview mirror. Um, you, you know, should any 60 year old dudes be out surfing 80 foot jaws? I don't think so. So where's that line for you? And I know where that line is for me. Um, but it's, it's interesting to be really good friends with some of these guys who are the world's best big wave surfers now. And they're right in the heart of that chapter in their lives. And it is pretty heavy on the families, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's probably that balance in a way, like in everyone, whether they're a big wave surfer or not, or a professional surfer or not, or just anyone out there that, that is a parent, like you kind of, you you feel stronger, right? Because your kids can give you this great amount of strength, but then the other side of that sword is like, Oh my God, what if, what if something happens? Like, and, and similar with parenting, you know, like you want, 
you want your kid to have all these great experiences and all these advantages, but you don't want to go too far and like, oh, they didn't, they didn't ever have to kind of have experiences that built their character. Right. And, and I mean, you know, talking about your kids in a way like Jackson in particular, like is such an incredible talent, but he's someone that at a very young age has obviously been in the limelight. Is that, is that something that you as a parent kind of wrestle with in the sense of like, okay, let's make sure we're giving him the advantages without kind of overdoing it and make sure that he's got a bit of fight in him because you have to have that whether you're going to be a pro surfer or not. That's a really good question. And it's something I wrestle with, like uh, probably the thing I think about the most, to be quite honest. Sure. To, to, to give you some background, I mean, I grew up pretty poor. Like mm. um, just to put it bluntly, I mean, we our family didn't have money. So when there was a, when I qualified to go to like state championships, just to Oahu, we literally had to do fundraisers. We were like selling cinnamon bread and doing um, like car washes, literally. So, mm. I mean, people don't do that anymore. It was crazy. There was no yeah. GoFundMe. There was no like, um, you know, it just was a different time. And, and so, but that, I feel like that was as hard as it was to be a kid who I, there was a lot of opportunities that I had that I couldn't. I couldn't do. There's a lot of mm -hmm. trips that a lot of other kids were doing that I just couldn't do. I couldn't afford it. And then the moment I was old enough to get a job, I did. I was a busboy. Yeah. And I would save my money all summer and then I'd move to the North Shore and live off that money in the winter. And I bought a crappy little car and you know, slept on my friend's, you know, couch and I just did whatever I had to do. I didn't have like a team manager picking me up at the airport and taking me to my team room and having a stocked fridge. It was like I didn't have those those types of things happening in my life. And I would have loved them, but looking back, I wouldn't trade it. You know? Right. Um, and that adversity, that toughness, that, that those conditions created a lot of toughness in me and a lot of the other kids that were coming at that, at that point that you just can't duplicate that, you know, what that gives you. There's no, there's, there's nothing you can do to, to compete with that. Like look at a guy like Italo, Look at a guy like um, Felipe and, mm -hmm. you know, a guy like um, Adriano de Souza, a guy like Kelly. Yeah. You know, like these guys had really gnarly upbringings, really hard. Like they were either going to make it in surfing or they were going to, you know, most of those people would have never even gone to college. You know, they, their families just couldn't afford it. So, you know, that adversity gives you such an advantage later in life, as hard as it is. And that, and not to, not to go on forever with that, but personally, as a parent now I've, I've, you know, I'm not like wildly successful or anything like that, but I have the kind of success that my family never had in my life. Hmm. And I'm really grateful for that. And I love to, you know, I, I, I have a lifestyle I can't, I can't believe I have. I'm able to travel yeah. and, you know, not have a normal job and be able to surf as much as I want. It's like incredible luxury. It seems sounds simple to some people, but I value it completely. And sometimes I wonder if my kids don't have, well, I, I, I know that my kids don't have enough adversity in their lives. Right. Both my kids, my, my son and my daughter, um, they have it pretty darn good. I was talking to Griffin about this this morning. I definitely like, something that I worry about is life is not hard enough. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of kids out there, not just mine, but it's creating a lot of like weak, soft kids out there. Um, and it's a concern for sure. Um, you can only just got to look around at the kids nowadays. All oh, there's just in their phones and their brains are turning to mush mm -hmm. and they just have no, hardly any of them have a strong passion to do anything real. Um, and so that's like something I work on all the time with my kids. I really try to instill hard work and discipline and it's not easy to do. You know, it really isn't like you can tell a kid over and over and over how lucky they are, but there is no giving them perspective without giving them perspective. And, and I've tried to, um, you know, we've been lucky enough to travel. And like a lot of times we go to places like Nicaragua and El Salvador and Indonesia and even Fiji. And at, when we go to those places, I try to expose my kids to, you know, this is how people live in different parts of the world. It's not, this is not Orange County anymore. This is not Hawaii anymore. Like mm -hmm. this is the, the, these are the way kids live here and try and spend time with the local kids and see how they live and just give them some exposure of like what reality really looks like for kids that aren't spoiled kids in America, 
be quite totally. honest. Well, I mean, I, I think that's really well said. I mean, and that's, you know, as a, I've got nine year old twins like that, that, that's the tension I think most of us wrestle with, you know, and, and you, you named a bunch of surfers, but you could probably, if we're just going to keep it within surfing, like look at virtually every world champion for the past five decades, almost to a person, they probably came from, you know, broken homes and, or, you know, lower income situations. And yeah. they have that fight in them, you know, and, and surfing's been around long enough and sort of um, professional surfing to now where you kind of have dynastic families in surfing and you've got children of professional surfers coming up, obviously, you know, your own as well. And, and what we were talking about before in the conversation about that, the information age has really democratized access to surfing information. The point of difference really becomes motivation. And, and I would say in the last five to 10 years, specifically on the men's side, that's probably where the Brazilian storms come from, right? If everyone's got access to the same technique and the same fitness and the same diet and the same boards, like who's hungrier, you know, the, the, the kid from Orange County that was sponsored when they were eight or the kid that, you know, is, is paying for their family to eat, right? Like in, in a way you're like, that's the difference. And, and you can't change like, you know, your own circumstances. You can't change like the situation with your kids. Like, and then as a parent, it's like, yeah, like I worked hard. I want them to have a good life. I love them. They're my life. Um, but it's hard, right? Because you almost have to, and this is the wrong word to say, but like manufacture adversity if, if none exists, because you know that that's 100%. what's best for them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's very hard to do, right? No, it's so hard. Yeah. As a parent. Yeah. And it's, uh, this sounds like really trivial, but like, Say, say like for my kids or for, 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 for example, like Jackson, he's a really good surfer. He's very talented and he learns very quickly and all that. Um, but he's really not super good at serving contests hmm. and serving contests is really hard for him, really hard. Um, and serving contests is hard for a lot of kids, but you know, some kids win every single contest, every sure. single weekend, they come down and down to Huntington beach in their Ugg boots 51 weeks in a row and like win every single contest. And then they get back in their sprinter van and leave <laughs> and then they come back the next weekend and do it again, you know, over and over and over. And they just like David, hammers, David amateur. Eggers. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. And there's like the, there's like the 2023 David Eggers. Right. Yeah, they're yeah. like four, 14 years old and they can't lose. Right. Um, it just, they figured out competing at a really young age. And my, my kid's definitely not one of those. Like he's, you know, you, you put his clips together and he, he's a good surfer and all that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's really hard for him. Surfing Connors is really hard for him. And, he gets waxed by kids that, um, you know, you, you wouldn't think that would beat him all the time, very consistently. And I'm so grateful for that. I tell him all the time, I'm like, it's the best thing that can happen to you right. is just getting smashed by these other kids. Like that's the only thing in your life really besides school that is frustratingly hard. Um, and like embrace that it's supposed to be hard, believe it or not. Like just because the rest of your life is comfortable, don't, don't think this discomfort is wrong because the discomfort is going to make you who you are in the future, whether it's in surfing or, or in other, other parts of your life, the, the, what, what's hard now is going to create the person you're going to be, not the easy parts. Totally. And I mean, it's, I mean, in surfing, it's so interesting too, because it, it's similar with a lot of sports, but like the, like, like kids and their bodies, they change so much between, you know, 12 and 22. Right. And so, it always baffles me when, you know, whatever companies and agents, et cetera, everyone's like pouring all this energy into kids when they're really young. Cause it's like, that's not a guarantee. Like they, they might grow 12 inches in three years. They might completely burn out. There might be some kid out there that's was not a David Edgars that, that all of a sudden is going to turn up at 19 and be the best surfer on the planet just because of what they're doing. You know, there's just so much uncertainty when kids are kind of developing as well. It's, it's really interesting to kind of watch. Yeah, it's a, I mean, yeah, that's a can of worms. Yeah. It's a can of worms. <laughs> we'll save that for the next episode. Br bringing, it back, bringing it back to the Billabong Pro Pipeline, which is starting here in a couple of weeks. Obviously, you've got your charges that you're working with across the, the Hawaiian events. But generally speaking, if you're looking at the men's and women's championship tour this year, who do you anticipate are going to be kind of forces to reckon with? We've got you know, Olympic qualification on the line this year. We've got a returning from injury, John, John Florence, a returning from injury, Caroline Marks, a returning from injury, Gabriel Medina, who based on his Instagram clips, looks like he's on some Ivan Drago bullshit. He looks so strong. It's like a kind of insane, 
you know, as yeah. someone who's been around the sport for so long and has so much knowledge, who are the people you're keeping your eye on across these opening few events? Uh, I'm just looking at the ratings right now, the, the rankings. Um, I mean, I, I, I think on the women's side, we're going to see a shakeup. I think we're going to see it become much, much harder for like someone like Molly Picklum to not get into that top three equation. You know, people like um, Katie Simmers, um, even Caroline Marks, she's surfing incredible. Like, I feel like last year was like a kind of like a pause year for her, just going through some stuff personally and going through sure. through whatever she's going through. But like, she she was off the she was kind of off the radar for a bit last year out of commission, and and then at the end of last year, she like was putting out clips and like she's such a hammer, like serving with so much power and so much style and so much poise. She's going to be a force to be reckoned with. And I think the girls' side is really exciting, to be quite honest. Like, I'm really, really excited about the women's tour. Um, Gabriella Ryan, uh, Gabriella Bryan, I'm sorry, is an absolute hammer. I've been surfing with her a lot at like places like Sunset and Haliva, and she's so powerful and so mature already. And she's so young. Yeah. She surfs with so much power and so much brute force and a lot of grace at the same time. Um, I'm really excited about the women's side, to, to be honest. And I think some of those younger girls, like um, like Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, um, Molly Picklum, um, Caroline Marks will be amazing. And then um, on the men's side, yeah, I mean it's 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 hard it's hard not to talk about Gabriel because I feel like he's crazy fit and he seems super focused and it seems like whatever was happening in the previous chapter of his life that was kind of like had his his mind on pause seems mm. to have subsided and he seems to be refocused and re-energized and really happy about competing and showing up. And I think he's excited about how good everybody's surfing. You know, I, th I feel like people have kind of not caught up, but I feel like the, the, the gap is kind of narrowing and like people are really surfing on, on Gabriel's level. Right. Um, I've been surfing with John a lot this year, not so much surfing with him, but like really like watching at close range watching John surf this last couple of weeks and he is surfing at 100% for sure. He looks very injury free. He looks freed up and super powerful and going a million miles an hour into turns with full commitment. Um, Italo is funny. Italo was kind of like, um, kind of like, I feel like Italo was like off the radar last year, like mm. had a bunch of like, kind of like didn't compete really well. And, maybe wasn't serving his absolute best and firing on all cylinders. And then at the end of the year, he like really was super resilient mentally and stepped it up, you know? And so I think he'll be really difficult to beat. And then I think we just kind of had a, just a slight glimpse of kind of what Griffin is, mm. is, is, is really um, how much potential Griffin Colapinto really has. I think if he can be become a little bit more, you know, I think just like that maturity and, and experience has has kind of gone in his favor now. Like he was kind of groming out the last couple of years a little bit still, even though his surfing is so mature and so polished and so kind of ahead of its time. I think kind of like mentally and, and preparation wise and stuff like that, there was like still some gaps probably in his game and the game he's bringing to his surfing. And I think he's filled a lot of those gaps. And I think he's going to be crazy impressive this year. Very difficult to beat. I mean, very, very difficult to beat. And he's incredibly good. And in, he basically has no weaknesses in every condition, backhand, forehand, point breaks, beach breaks, heavy water waves. He's really gnarly at all of them. And then it's hard not to talk about the men's without talking about Ethan Ewing, because like among my kids' friends, among Jackson's buddies, their favorite server is Ethan Ewing, hmm. almost all of them. They all try to serve like Ethan, which is kind of wild, right? Like a couple of years ago, he, a couple of years ago, he was like the easiest draw on the tour. Let's right. be honest. Like yeah. he, for a whole year, he was on tour and he was like the easiest draw. Like guys who were on the very, not even on the radar were beating him. Um, and he was just making tons of mistakes and, and, and he, and he went off the tour, did, did a ton of work, came back 10, 15 pounds heavier, much stronger, much more polished, tons of commitment in his surfing and no hesitation. And man, I feel like, we're going to see a very strong and super, super confident Ethan Ewing in 2023. 
I love it. Well, the, the Billabong Pro Pipeline starting on January 29th. We're going to see how all those predictions pan out very, very quickly. Uh, before we go, we, we put a feeler out for questions from the Instagram community at, at the lineup pod. We, we got a ton back, but, but uh, we've whittled them down to, uh, to three for you. First question is from Et Norbell R, who asks, is there, any, is, there, are there, is there still any pending surf place on your bucket list that you haven't been to yet? Probably Skeleton Bay in Namibia. I've almost pulled the trigger a couple times, but like geographically speaking, anybody who knows where Namibia is, like if I drilled a hole straight down and popped out the other end, that's where Skeleton Bay is on the other <laughs> side of the earth. So trying to chase a swell there is like a logistical nightmare and a pretty, it's, it's one of those places that's really easy to get skunked. So that's probably the reason I haven't gotten there yet, but it's still on my list. I like it. Uh, next question is from at Gabriel MV08, who asks, between Kelly Slater and Ross Williams, who had the edge competing against you in the 1990s? I'd say that Ross and I were kind of 50-50. Like, we probably, like, had a, we had a, probably a similar win rate against each other, but really fun. A lot of, uh, Sparks would always fly when I would surf against Ross. Um, uh, Kelly, he probably had a 75% win rate against me. I, I, I had him, I beat him a couple, I beat him a bunch of different important times. So I actually had a pretty good record against him relative to the other people, but he smoked me a whole lot more than I beat him, convincingly. <laughs> well, the nice thing is that you both probably remember the times that you beat him. So that's, that's helpful because he probably holds on to that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, last one we got here is from at white underscore Oakley's who asks, what do you consider your greatest achievement in or out of the water? Raising good children. Yeah, by far. Good one. The hardest and most important thing you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Without question. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone yeah. that wrote in at, at the lineup pod. Um, we're now down to our final segment. It is the lightning round. These are 10 questions for you to answer as quickly as you can. Uh, if you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Whew, that's a good one. Ugh, that's a hard one. Uh, probably just a normal shortboard performance thruster. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? Atomic Habits. Best surf film ever? Uh, five Summer Stories. Mm. One wave you never have to go back to? Nazare. If you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Uh, P-Pass. Uh, best person to share a lineup with? My daughter, Charlie. Worst person to share a lineup with? <laughs> um, oh. A foiler. <laughs> Last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Uh, continuing the way I'm going. I love it. Shane Dorian, um, this has been a personal treat for me to get to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the lineup. Um, can't wait to see what you and your family do next. And um, yeah, look forward to uh, catching up with you on the North Shore here in a couple of weeks for the Billabong Pro Pipeline starting on January 29th. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun.